So risk manage it, management, managing risk, and uh, performance breakthroughs are kind of the theme here. So I think you'll see both of those heavily threaded throughout what we just accomplished as a nation and as a world um, on another planet. As far as risk is concerned, there is no such thing as zero risk. You can be aware of it, you can try to manage it, but you cannot eliminate it. And when you have things like uh, what I'm about to talk to you about, uh, there are inherent risks dealing with another planet. It has a mind of its own, just like the Earth does. It does things when it wants to, and you can't predict those. And then you have the basic risks of launch vehicle success rates and things. So you always have to deal with that. But the breakthrough performance that you're going to see here is truly remarkable. I mean, it, it still amazes me, actually. Before I get to curiosity, I'm going to talk a little bit about why in the world are we even doing this. Mars has been in the human culture for thousands of years. We've even got uh, evidence that cavemen recognized Mars as slightly different in the night sky than the other stars that they would see. It's red. It's very distinctively red. It tracks, because of its odd orbit inclination compared to Earth, it tracks a slightly odd orbit. It isn't perfectly circular. You can actually see it do loops in the sky. Rudimentary telescopes in the 1800s. Chaparelli is the guy that started the craze, frankly, about Mars. Um, he noticed through his telescopes all these lines and marks on the planet's surface and called them canali, which basically translates to channels. However, in English, canali moved to the word canals, and an entire generation of excitement was born. Um, the age of discovery and excitement in the early 1900s globally brought us an amazing uh, uh, focus on the planet Mars itself. This is not necessarily why we go today. This is why we go today, right? It's always been an exciting place to go, but now what we're finding is that this planet, frankly, has a different past than we ever thought it did. What we see today is a dry, barren world. A lot of lines, a lot of marks, but as we understand this planet more, what you see on the right side of your screen is probably what the history, the historical perspective of Mars, three and a half to four billion years ago, was. We see things like this feature here, Gusev Crater, which is where the Spirit and Opportunity rovers landed. And you can see the, the crater itself at the top of the chart. And you can see the, the channel that runs through this. In an artist's concept, this is probably what that looked like billions of years ago. We see this with Spirit and Opportunity. This, this image is from Spirit at the top. Well, let me start with the bottom left image first. This is an area called Home Plate in the Columbia Hills of Gusev Crater. It's amazing because the white spot in the center actually turns out to be, after years of investigation, a hydrothermal vent from a volcanic system. What that means is, and you can see with, and I was talking at breakfast with some folks, about the fact that Spirit had a broken right front wheel, and it was fixed in place. So we turned around and drove Spirit backwards for years, dragging that wheel behind us. It was a beautiful trenching tool, because we were driving through home plate and we just happened to see all this white material behind us that we dug up. So we stopped and we spent some time analyzing. It's pure silica. It's sand. It is hydrothermal vent material. And if you look at the picture on the right, no, we don't have humans on Mars yet. That's in Yellowstone. This is exactly the kinds of materials that we see in Yellowstone, right? A warm and wet past. The Odyssey Orbiter did mapping of hydrogen content on the planet. Blue means lots of hydrogen. Locked up typically in hydrated minerals, water. And the center section is dry. So what this implies, right, is that the whole northern section and southern sections of the planet Mars are covered in water. Well, you don't see that, do you? Well, in fact, you do. It's uh, not only is it underground, I'm gonna show you a little bit of that, but we have polar caps that we now understand drive the climate on Mars. We have kilometers thick ice caps that form in the winter in the north, and as summer comes, those ice caps, just like on Earth, they recede and the water uh, dissipates into the atmosphere. The southern polar cap is a little different in that it's mostly CO2 ice, but again, it's kilometers thick. There's an enormous amount of water on this planet. The Phoenix lander, launched in 07, landed in 08, uh, we put it up in the Martian Arctic, about the equivalent of uh, northern Maine. 
It survived until about November of that year because it was buried in ice as the polar cap formed in Martian winter. But you can see this picture taken from uh, the camera on the end of the arm looking underneath the lander. You can see the thrusters and all. But those shiny, and you can see the landing legs. Those shiny areas are ice. This looks like the Alaskan tundra in the, uh, in the summertime in, in, uh, on, on Earth. And this is solid ice. It landed on an ice sheet covered by a few centimeters of dust. And then we have images like this. This is down at about the level of Maryland in the United States, where the high-rise imager on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter actually identified new meteorites that have hit the surface. And all that white is ice. Those meteorites have unearthed ice. And, and how we know that that's ice is we have a hyperspectral imager that can tell us what the composition of that is. But over a few months, that all dissipated away because the atmosphere is so dry. So this is truly a water planet. It's remarkable what we've found. What you see here, actually, you'll notice the streaks. This is a, this is a crater, and it goes down. The, the right side of the image is the high point, and it goes down into the crater on the left. And what we see is we see streaks of moisture in the summer that go down, that form and run down into the crater bottom. This is not just one episode. We've seen more than 20 of these things. They occur seasonally, and they concert, con, uh, occur consistently. So it's a pretty amazing amount of active water on this planet. So it really is a water planet, just like Earth. The comparisons, the commonalities between Earth and Mars grow greater every single day. It's pretty amazing. So we've gone through a lot of different opinions of what we might see. Uh, through time as we understood this planet, and who knows what we might find down in the bottom right as we keep going. Marvin's out there somewhere. So on to MSL Curiosity. Curiosity is not just one mission that we said, hey, why don't we go do this? The Mars Exploration Program has been able to learn this much about Mars and its relationship to Earth and the potential for life on the planet Mars because of a consistently executed, carefully constructed, strategically planned program of missions that began back in the year 2000. And you can see all these missions here. And the theme we've had for the last decade is follow the water. We have been trying to learn what I just explained in, in a few minutes to you about the planet. Was the water processes, are the water processes still intact? Where did the water go? We found it. One of the key elements for life is water. We know we have the energy. We know that there's uh, minerals and things that could provide uh, energy to life forms, we've proven the water. MSL is the culmination of a decade's worth of careful research and investigation, and frankly, all the missions in here have been groundbreaking missions. But MSL Curiosity provided us the first opportunity to put a mobile analytical laboratory on the surface of Mars and really understand this. The next decade we're moving into is seeking the signs of life. So Curiosity's job, now that we've proven the water story, is to understand whether habitats could have ever existed on the planet. Not to find life, that's an almost impossible thing to do, but to find out if habitats could have ever existed that may have supported life or could support life now. But the exciting story here is about the technological breakthrough. That, that's the current story because we're just getting started with the scientific story on curiosity. As you can see, a lot of countries, a lot of countries have tried to get to the surface of Mars or get around Mars. And frankly, it's a really tough thing to do. The success rate is lousy, right? Now, we've been doing pretty well in the US, right? We got Spirit down, we got Opportunity down, we got MRO in orbit, we got uh, Phoenix on the surface, and now we've put MSL down. But as a, as a global nation, we're really not very good at this yet. But why is it hard? Well, you know, hey, you know, we brought Apollo astronauts back. We bring uh, space station astronauts back all the time. Uh, this doesn't seem like a big deal. Well, the problem is with Mars is it has enough atmosphere to be a pain in the neck and not enough to really help you. The Earth has a great thick atmosphere. We can slow things down um, and drop them in the ocean and all you need to do is, is ballistic entry and a parachute and you're in good shape. Piece of cake. The moon is easy, believe it or not. No atmosphere at all allows us to use retro propulsion. So we can actually descend the entire distance from orbit to the surface of the moon with thrusters. 
can't do that in an atmosphere. A thing called supersonic retropropulsion, where you have engine flow into a supersonic airstream, we don't understand how to do that yet. That's a technology we haven't broken through on yet. But you can use that on the moon. You can't use that on Earth, you can use that on the moon. So Mars forces us to use multiple techniques to slow down and gain control. Then you have to land. So you can start at the top of the atmosphere, but you have to land. And it's that last kilometer or so that's really kind of challenging. Um, you can't carry enough fuel to do uh, something the size of Curiosity, like we did with Phoenix, with retropropulsion subsonic for the last kilometer. So you can't do that with something the size of Curiosity, which you'll see how big it really is. With Spirit and Opportunity, and actually Pathfinder before that, we did it with airbags. So it, yeah, that's kind of a crazy thought, right? Just a bouncing ball. And frankly, uh, it was amazing. It, that thing bounced five stories when it hit the ground. It bounced five stories. And it bounced about 100 yards. It didn't go very far horizontally, but it sure went high vertically, long way vertically. That was a ballistic entry also. So we had these big, huge areas that we had to pick that were smooth and flat and, and easy to land in. Because we said, OK, this is the top of the atmosphere. We're going to land somewhere in this big circle on the ground. How big is that circle? The Spirit and Opportunity landing error ellipse was 150 kilometers long and 50 kilometers wide. Talk about risk. You've got to make sure that you don't have any craters in there. You don't have any cliffs in there. It's tough. Phoenix, a little different. Also ballistic entry, but up in the Arctic, it's flat. There's not much up there. So uh, we had a lot of choices of where to go. And we wanted to use soft landing. It's cheap. This is an inexpensive way to do this. And so we put it on the ground this way. And, and that worked really well. Spirit and Opportunity weigh about 175 kilograms, the whole, the whole thing. Um, Phoenix weighed maybe 250, 300 kilograms. MSL weighs a metric ton. So we are not in the same category. So in 2002, the science community said, you know, let's put an analytical lab on the surface. Let's do that. So what we did was we picked a bunch of instruments, and I'll show you those instruments in a minute, picked a bunch of instruments and designed a mission around them to put it on the surface and drive those instruments around to do discoveries. Well, what, when you wrap a lot of instruments, uh, when you have a huge mass of instruments and you wrap them in something to drive around, it gets kind of big. So we realized you can't land them with airbags. They're too big. The airbags pop. You don't get a bounce. Can't do supersonic retropropulsion. You can't do low altitude uh, propulsion, as a matter of fact. But we tried to figure out how to do that. So uh, we had legs on it where we drive the rover off the platform. Uh, we had a thing called a carport where it landed and the rover was underneath it and landed on legs. And then we set the rover on the ground. And, and we just went through a whole lot of things. Um, none of them seemed to be panning out. Um, so the gentleman who actually invented the airbag idea, a guy named Rob Manning, one of the smartest guys I know, uh, came up with the idea of, well, hey, Viking, back in the 70s, had these big engines and landed about a 500 kilogram spacecraft with that. Why don't we put the engines on top and then just lower the, the, the rover underneath it? Put the engines on the top instead of on the bottom. Because you don't want to drive around the surface of Mars with you know, a couple of hundred kilograms worth of propulsion, plumbing, and tanks, and all that junk. You don't need it anymore. Seemed a little nutty. Uh, I took over this program in 2004. When I went out and sat down and went through the material with these guys, my first reaction was, this is obviously California. You guys are smoking something. This is absolutely nuts. So, and that's how it goes. Everybody that looks at this the first time goes, you guys are out of your mind. So uh, I remember the first meeting we had with uh, the administrator of the agency, Mike Griffin. So we went in, we had a one hour meeting on the book. Now Mike is your consummate engineer. I've known him for 20 years. Um, and, and I mean, he just loves engineering challenges. He just absolutely loves them. So you know, a guy at the administrator level, right, reports directly to the president. If you can get 20 minutes on his calendar, you're doing well. So we got an hour, so I was pretty impressed by that. Say, that's great. OK, so Mike, we're going to sit down. So we spent four hours <laughs> with Mike. And his admin assistants were always in there, kind of, oh, you're missing this meeting, you're missing this meeting. He was having so much fun talking about this sky crane technique. Uh, he just didn't want to stop. Well, finally, you know, everybody's, everybody's uh, public transportation left, and we all had to go. And that's what ended the meeting. <laughs> I don't think Mike would have ever left. But it is. It's a crazy concept. But, but you know, we do this on Earth all the time, so why not? You just replace the helicopter on top 
with a rocket-powered system because you don't have enough air for, for, a, uh, for a helicopter. So what evolved over the years is this architecture. And I'm going to walk you through this briefly because the next series of slides are about how we built this thing. So at the top is the cruise stage, that, that long flat thing at the very top. Its sole job is to maintain the temperatures and provide power to the system in the cruise to Mars. And we get rid of it when we get there. So it's, it has no computers in it, it's not very smart, it's got a propulsion system, and it's got thermal systems, and that's all, and, and uh, solar panels, that's it. The aero shell consists of the white back shell. If I use this laser, I only get half the audience. So, let, but let's see. So this is the back shell, and this is the heat shield. So back shell and heat shield. Sort of looks like Apollo when you clamshell it up, and that's called the aero shell. So the device in the center, the next one down from the aero shell, is the sky crane itself, actually called the descent stage. Sky crane is actually a technique, not a system. That's the descent stage. And what you can see sticking off the right side is the landing radar. So we have a six-beam radar designed specifically for this job that um, gives us altitude um, and gives us horizontal as well, as, I'm sorry, vertical as well as horizontal velocities as we descend to the planet. And then underneath that in the gray thing, that's the rover. So we pack the rover up, the wheels come up, the mast goes down, and we compact it all up, stick it up underneath the sky crane, and that's how we get it to the surface. Not without peril, not without risk. The largest supersonic parachute ever designed. We pulled uh, computational fluid dynamics capabilities in that had never been used for this type of two-body airflow problem before and utilized those tools for the very first time to design this, this uh, parachute. And you can see how big this guy is. It's about 22 meters across. And we had our failures. Uh, we went through many, many years of wondering if we could build a parachute this big um, and use it at, at uh, push and Mach 2, frankly. It was pretty high. Actuators. Most folks probably don't remember, but we were supposed to launch this guy in 2009, and we didn't launch it until 2011. Planetary dynamics, orbital mechanics, every 26 months, Earth and Mars are aligned such that you can make a short Type 1 transit. So you can get there if you launch at a different time. So we could have launched uh, six months later, but we'd have still gotten there at the same time. And you have to change your cruise sy systems to be able to sustain this thing in space for a couple of years, and there's no point. The reason we could not launch was, number one, these actuators, and number two, the avionics. I'm going to show you those. These actuators, on the outside, they don't look like much. These are, th this one here is uh, one of the wheel drive actuators. It's about this big. But it, it has an encoder on the end. It's got a small electric motor, and then it's a planetary reduction gear set. There are 600 parts in each one of these. They are enormously complicated devices to create the kind of torque off of a battery with battery power, the kind of torque you need to move a one-ton rover on the surface of Mars. And we started off not understanding the risk, not just from that perspective, but we thought what we were going to do because of temperatures is avoid wet lubrication, because wet lube you have to warm it up before you use it on Mars because it's so cold at night. So we went and we did, we plated titanium gears with a dry film lubricant. Not a good plan. Didn't work. We, we went through years of trying to figure out how to do this, and we eventually fell back to traditional stainless steel and wet lube, but, but we built them. And you can see, well, maybe you can see, these, these things are everywhere. We built about 60 of them. There's about 30 of these actuators all over the rover, everything from raising the mast to turning the masthead, rolling the wheels, steering, they're everywhere. If they didn't work, we didn't have a mission. The second big challenge was avionics. This is the inside of the rover. How you get to all this stuff is from the belly. So you drop the belly pan off, and, and you take the rover, you flip it upside down, you take the belly pan off. Packing density is absolutely enormous here compared to any other spacecraft. You can see in the front the big gold square thing is the SAM instrument. That's our primary uh, analytical tool. I'll show you more about that in a second. Next to it is an instrument called Kemen, which is an X-ray diffraction uh, instrument. First time one of those has ever been put on another planet. Pretty exciting device. Uh, and then the avionics. The avionics were really difficult. The, the, and, and it's not that we can't go buy processors and things that can do the job. The problem is none of the stuff you buy off the shelf is radiation hardened. It will not survive the transit to the planet, and it will not survive on the surface because of the radiation environments. 
So, so we're dealing almost, we're not quite Commodore 64 era things, but I mean, that's about what our, our processing power isn't a whole lot more than that. This is that SAM instrument. So if you think that the avionics complexity in the rover is tough, this is what just the SAM instrument looks like when you take it off. Six gas chromatograph columns, a mass spectrometer, a tunable laser spectrometer, 77 sample cups in that big round carousel. Some of them have derivatization uh, fluids in them and some of them are just empty sample cups. So what happens is we put samples into those cups and we run them through a series of tests if we want to uh, and we pick what we want to find out what the content of materials are. The difference between this and Kemen is this will tell us if we've got something, some uh, complex organic compound like coal, but then you can put it in Kemen and it understands, it will be able to tell us what the crystal structure of that is so that we can actually determine whether that organic compound is coal or a diamond, which Valentine's Day is coming, guys, make sure you're not buying coal. Okay. And then we test it. So we spent years working through these problems, pushed the launch out uh, two years, which is really politically not a very fun thing to do. But, uh, but an important mission like this, we, we did get the backing of Congress and the White House after, after a while, and uh, we're able to do that. And so then you test it. And because, um, as Helmut said, you only get one shot at this, uh, you better test it well. So we shake it, we bake it, we freeze it, we drop it, we do all kinds of stuff to it. We electronically test it. This is the flight descent stage, and if you look very carefully, you can see, I'm not sure I can even do this well, if you look very carefully, you can see the rover wheels sticking out. So the rover is already underneath the descent stage. So they pack up very nicely and actually very tightly. See, you can see the wheel sticking out here and over here. So the big orange things are propulsion tanks. This is just a cool picture. Um, this is the rover fully assembled. Um, in the thermal vac chamber where we put it, through it pace, put it through its paces over the temperatures and pressures it will actually see on Mars. We spend uh, over a month in that uh, facility doing that. This is uh, packing to ship. So uh, you pack it up and the wheels all, uh, all pack up. Like I said, the mast is laying down and the technicians are just finalizing it to ship. Then you stick it under the descent stage. You stick the descent stage with the rover inside the back shell, so you're looking at it from underneath. And if you think that the uh, MSL system is large, this is the launch vehicle fairing. It's getting ready to be clamshelled into the launch vehicle fairing. And you can see the cruise stage down there at the bottom of it, and so it's, it's ready to roll. So once it goes in there, we don't see it again. And this is launch. Beautiful launch. Oh, uh, picture perfect. What you're seeing in the top right actually is the second stage of the launch vehicle has a forward-looking camera. So it's looking at the cruise stage and the solar panels of MSL. Now, it looks like MSL is spinning up. Actually, the second stage starts that rotation for us. So it fires its thrusters and starts that spin rate up for us. And then once it lets go of, as you'll see it happen here, and you can see how it's rotating because the sun line's going across the solar panels. So it actually pops the thing off with a spring mechanism and pyro-fired spring mechanism, and then the second stage spins down, and so that's why it looks like uh, MSL is actually spinning on its own. This is the beginning of a 350-mile, eight-and-a-half-month journey to Mars. And this is the seven minutes of terror on one slide. So as it, uh, we start at the top of the atmosphere, as Helmut said, at 13,000 miles an hour. And now what's interesting is we only cruise to Mars at about five or 6,000 miles an hour. But as we get closer, we get into the gravity well of Mars. And as we do that, about we, we can feel it a few hours before we actually get there. But the last 30 minutes or so, it accelerates, and it accelerates until it hits the top of the atmosphere at 13,000 miles an hour. It's really pretty remarkable with a system this large how fast it accelerates. What's different about this, amongst all the other things that are different, is this is not a ballistic entry. This is a completely guided entry and the spacecraft makes its own decisions as it goes down. We tell it 
where it is at the top of the atmosphere, and we tell it where it's supposed to be on the surface. So it knows its two fixed points. And actually, we hit a little keyhole that's about seven kilometers in size at the top of the atmosphere. That's where our navigation team, after 350 million miles, that's not too bad, a little seven kilometer box, you know. So that's what they're aiming for. So they hit that, tell the spacecraft where it is, and it has a series of titanium masses called ballast that it ejects as it cruises down to the surface through these ballistic periods. And it actually steers itself. It changes the angle of attack so that it can gain lift. It actually, so it, instead of coming straight in ballistically, it actually comes in and it kind of levels out a little bit, flies somewhat parallel to the surface of Mars. It makes decisions on S-turns. So it can dump ballast and slow itself down by doing S-turns. We had a program to do as many as three, it did two. It decided it needed two. So it did two S-turns before it's down to about 1.7 Mach, where it pops the parachute out, slows us down to um, a few hundred miles an hour, the parachute, uh, then allows us uh, to get down to very, very subsonic, a couple of hundred miles an hour, um, and complete this process. So I think what's next, no it's not. So, and as Helmut said, we hit the top of the atmosphere, and when we know it hit the top of the atmosphere, it's actually over already. So we're watching a movie, and we don't know what the end of this movie is. So it's, uh, it's a little nerve-wracking. Um, and, and, and frankly, it's nerve-wracking also because we've never done this except ballistically. So uh, there are so many things, there are thousands of things that are going on. Even something as simple as releasing the cruise stage, if it doesn't come off, the mission is over. Parachute doesn't come out, the mission is over. All the ballast masks don't come out or they don't come out at the right time, mission is over. Sky crane engines don't come on, even one of them. So we have eight engines, even if one of them doesn't come on, we're probably over. We're going to hit the ground pretty hard anyway. So it's, uh, it's full of single point failures. This is how people felt at the beginning. We hit the top of that atmosphere and, and what's interesting is we all knew it was over already. But, uh, but boy, I'll tell you, the tension, it was just a, it was a step function in tension levels. Let's see. I guess I should talk about that in a second. So what you see on the bottom right is um, an image taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter high-rise camera. It has a resolution of 0.6 meters on the surface, so it can identify from 400 kilometers up. It can identify a coffee table and tell you what the diameter is and everything else from a couple of, like we said, about 400 kilometers up. The crossing angles on this were quite interesting. So as MSL was coming in from kind of the northwesterly direction, MRO was coming up from the bottom and it does an orbit of the planet every 90 minutes. And its track was crossing just as MSL parachute was coming out. So it was coming up and over, and so we take the imager and, and point it where it's supposed to be, and then slew the entire spacecraft like that to try to keep the imager pointing down and try to take a picture like this. Um, Space-based acrobatics is what it is. And the MRO team did an amazing job, and you get a picture like this where if it's bigger, you can actually see the shoot parachute riser lines in this image. It's just absolutely amazing. And we actually have pictures of this thing on the surface now. So you can see the parachute laying out there, you can see the colors, you can see the reefing lines, and we watch it as we go over every once in a while. You can see the thing blowing around in the breeze. It's pretty cool. So as we get further into this, <laughs> we're, we're now uh, in the descent. And it's pretty hard to see, but those screens in the back highlight what stage we're in. This is not long after entry. And, uh, and so we have several kinds of people here. We have the blowers, we have the pacers. We, 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 we have the people that are trying to ignore the tension. Um, and yours truly sitting there, uh, third one in. Um, it looks like I'm reading email, but actually I'm not. So it wasn't quite that calm. Um, what, what I had is we had a team in Times Square, and they were sending me they were texting me photos of the crowd in, uh, in Times Square, which was really a blast. It was really kind of fun to see that. So, so uh, you'll see our blower here, Dave Lavery. He's, uh, he's a guy that uh, worked for me as, as the, the main engineer uh, at headquarters that keeps track of it. The guy pacing, the guy walking there, is Pete Tysinger. He's the uh, project manager for this. Uh, absolutely an amazing guy, uh, done an amazing job, but he always paces, always paces. You can see the administrator of the agency, first guy, if you kind of work your way through that line, uh, with the white shirt on. I think he's praying. 
which uh, was probably the right choice at that point in time. And, uh, and as we get closer, you'll see the attention span shifts. Now, why in the heck I'm looking at the screens on the right and everybody else is looking at the screens on the left? Um, I don't know, but I guess I didn't have my glasses on or something. I don't know. 